When you hear this, turn the page. Visitors. Dr. Juliet Parrish was working in her laboratory near Los Angeles when she first heard about them. The door burst open and a young colleague rushed in. Have you heard the news? Juliet looked up from the bench where she was working with two other scientists. Heard what news, Ben? Ben Taylor flipped on the television set that sat on a high shelf in the laboratory. The screen filled with the image of a vast disc-shaped vessel hovering over San Francisco Harbor, so huge that the Golden Gate Bridge below looked like a child's toy. The TV announcer's voice came over in awesome tones. And reports have come from Paris, London, Moscow, Rome, Geneva, Buenos Aires, Tokyo, and all the descriptions of the spaceships have been identical. Our station at San Francisco now has it in vision. Yes, there it is. My gosh, the size of it. Ladies and gentlemen, these pictures are coming to you live from San Francisco. At almost the same moment, Juliet and her colleagues heard a low, pulsing hum... The laboratory mice began to race frantically around their cages. Julie looked puzzled. Ben, do you think... As if in answer to her unfinished question, the TV announcer spoke from the screen. There is also confirmation that yet another of the giant ships is moving in over Los Angeles. The scientists stared at each other in shocked silence. Within hours, there was only one topic of conversation throughout the world. The visitors. <laughs> In their vast spaceships, some five miles in diameter, they were everywhere. The whole world waited, tense, apprehensive, excited, frightened. The pulsing hum was being heard by all the world's population. Then the hum altered tone, swiftly echoing, then changed to a voice. 21, 20, 19, 18, 17... 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, The strangely resonant voice continued the countdown 10, while news commentators 9, explained that all over 8, the world, people were hearing 7, the same thing, each 6, in their own local language. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Citizens of the planet Earth, we bring you greetings. We come in peace. May we respectfully request that the Secretary General of the United Nations please come to the top of the UN building in New York at 0100 hours Greenwich Mean Time this evening. Thank you. Lots had been drawn to decide which cameraman and news commentator were to cover the historic events at the UN building. Mike Donovan and Christine Walsh drew the cards. Mike panned his camera across the Manhattan skyline and picked up the distinguished figure of the Secretary General. Mike stared upwards. The viewfinder of his camera pressed against his eye. He knew almost the entire world would be seeing these pictures, a world gone strangely silent. At exactly 0100 hours GMT, Mike zoomed in on a small dark opening at the side of the frighteningly gigantic spaceship. The opening was filled with something. Something that turned out to be a detached, streamlined shape swooping down toward them. He could hear Christine Walsh's professional voice. The smaller craft is moving at an angle downward now across 3rd Avenue and 39th, coming directly to the UN building. Mike Donovan followed the gleaming white shuttlecraft as it descended with barely a whisper of displaced air. 
Now the craft is drifting to a stop some 10 feet in the air above our heads. Now it lands and the air itself feels strange, vibrating slightly. A panel opened at the bottom side of the craft and a short ramp extruded onto the rooftop, resting there securely. The Secretary General mounted it and entered the spacecraft and after a few moments reappeared. A hushed world listened as he told them that the visitors from space had assured him that they had come in peace and that their supreme commander would shortly be addressing every nation simultaneously. Mike gasped as he saw the supreme commander appear. He'd expected differences. There were none. He appeared, a normal human male of middle years, and was clad in a reddish-colored pilot's flight suit. He spoke. Our planet is the fourth in distance from the star Sirius, some 8.7 light years from your Earth. We come in peace. You are the first intelligent life form we have encountered outside our solar system. We are very pleased to meet you. My name is John. Your Secretary General referred to me as Supreme Commander. Actually, I am only an admiral responsible for the small fleet around your planet. We have come on behalf of our great leader. We have come because we need your help. John went on to explain to an astounded world that they had environmental difficulties far worse than Earth and could not survive without assistance. In return, the visitors would gladly share the fruits of their own knowledge. Then Mike and Christine were invited on board and taken to the mother spaceship. Mike knew he was filming the event of the century as he took shots of the spaceship's interior. Through his camera, he saw large open areas with rows of shuttlecraft lined up on either side. John explained that each bay held about 36 shuttles and there were over 200 scattered throughout the great motherships of the fleet. He photographed the inner control room full of instrument graphs and readouts and crowds of red uniformed crew members. On, 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 in all sections of this gigantic, overwhelming, powerful spaceship. When the live television show was over, Mike and Christine met and talked to the crew members. As they moved about the docking bay, an extremely attractive woman entered. Mike took up his camera again and zoomed in on her. It was impossible to mistake the authority in her dark eyes and arrogant walk. Mike heard Christine's voice as the visitors came toward them. So you have both male and female members in your crew, then? John sounded faintly surprised. Yes, of course. This is Diana. She is second in command. Diana led the way, telling them about the restricted radioactive areas which powered the ship and vast spaces which would be storing the products from the Earth. Christine asked, How many people are there on this ship? Mike saw Diana hesitate for a second, then... Several thousand. Mike bit his lip. His brain whirled as he muttered to himself. And there are 50 ships like this here at the moment. That night, Mike and Christine watched the video of the program they had made about the visitors. Christine smiled wryly. Hmm. You took more close-ups of Diana than me, Mike. Mike said little. He was worried. Very, very worried indeed. The days passed by. The world tried to settle back to a routine. But it was impossible with the shadow and sounds of the visitors' spaceships hovering overhead. So big that in some cases, they blotted out the sun. And world opinion was divided about the visitors. Some welcomed it, felt it would bring prosperity and a new knowledge to the world. Others were suspicious, apprehensive, wary of the visitors' true intentions. Some people cooperated fully. Christine became the press liaison officer. Mike kept apart, distant. Uncertain, suspicious. And Juliet Parrish? She was distinctly uneasy, particularly since the day that one of the world's leading scientists, Dr. Jankowski, had made a public announcement that many leading scientists in the world of biomedical science had been plotting against the visitors. And when she saw her chief, the quiet, brilliant Dr. Metz, falsely arrested, she became desperately concerned and even angry when she heard Christine Walsh announce... As a result of the conspiracy and crimes of our scientists, the visitors' proposed scientific seminar will now be postponed. Julie realized that for some mysterious reason, scientists were a threat to the visitors. Other unpleasant happenings started. In the small town of San Pedro, 
the inhabitants rebelled against the visitors by blowing up one of their squad vehicles. Within hours, the whole population of the town had disappeared completely, mysteriously without trace. Whole towns in remote areas were suddenly bereft of people and animals, even mice and frogs. Mike Donovan decided he had to get into the mothership with his camera and discover the truth about the visitors. Using the experience of his previous visit, he managed to stow away on a shuttle ship. It was dangerous. It was stupid. But he'd always led a life of perilous missions. The shuttle bay on the mothership was just as he remembered it. Visitor technicians were everywhere. Mike crept forward, camera in hand. There was a steady rumble of machinery that covered any sounds he might make. He listened from the shadows. The lovely Diana was talking to Stephen, her security officer. You must be pleased, Diana. We have nearly secured all the continents. Diana smiled. It pleases me to serve our leader. Then to Mike's horror, she picked up a mouse from a nearby cage and ate it. He felt sick. Diana continued to talk. Of course, my thought conversion process doesn't work on every human. No, but when it does, it is remarkable. <laughs> yes. They actually believe a conspiracy of scientists exists. And of course, the false evidence we have planted reinforces this belief. Once we have eliminated or converted all the scientists, our task will be easier. Our leader could not have chosen anyone better than you, Diana. Mike saw Stephen pick up a frog and eat it. He couldn't believe his eyes. It was ghastly, hideous. He had to get away and show these camera shots to the world. He backed away through the air shaft, and then it was a visitor. The visitor lashed at him. Mike fought back. He was desperate, scratching, punching. His fingers sank into the visitor's face. A flap of skin came away. He was close enough to see into the visitor's mouth. There were two sets of teeth. Then the rest of the flap of skin came away like cheese wrapping. And Mike found himself looking at a reptile face. A forked tongue hissed out at him. Mike lashed back with his camera. You are reptiles. You are all reptiles with false skins. No wonder you eat. The visitor's tongue darted out. Mike hit back with his camera. The visitor fell. Mike ran and ran, threw himself into an open side of a shuttle plane just leaving for Earth as he heard an announcement. Emergency. When the music stops, turn the cassette over. Back on Earth, Mike managed to get his video shots on a TV coast-to-coast -coast hookup. But before the film was halfway through, all the screens were obliterated by the visitor's symbol. But he had shown the world enough. Resistance movements sprung up on every continent. He was marked down by the visitors as an arch-terrorist, and huge rewards were offered for his capture. Mike led a resistance headquarters, assisted by his colleagues from his war correspondent days, and Dr. Juliet Parrish and others, who had managed to contact him, joined forces to fight against the visitors. While the resistance fighters knew they were up against a ruthless, hideous race of alien invaders, they also came to learn that not all of them were bad, that some resented and rebelled against John and Diana's cruelties. 
In fact, there were cells of visitors' fifth colonists on the mother ships who wished to overthrow Diana and take friendly measures with Earth. The leader of these fifth colonists was a visitor called Martin. He made contact with the resistance movement, and without his help and that of other visitor fifth colonists, the resistance cause would have been hopeless. It was Martin who was responsible for Mike's second secret visit to the mothership. He had shown him great tanks in the hold of the spaceship. Mike had asked, What's going on, Martin? The tanks are full of water. Water? Why water? Pure H2O is the rarest and most valuable commodity you can imagine. One of the first resources industrial society pollutes. You've already started on Earth. We need your water desperately to save us. Indeed, we need everything you've got. But you've been taking water from our reservoirs. We would have shared it. Some of us wished it to be that way. Our leader wants it all. Everything you have. Everything. But Martin, the Earth will be a desert. Our people will die. No, we are taking your people too. Everything. Water, animals, humans. Mike gasped. Humans? So that's where the people of San Pedro and... Martin nodded sadly. Preserved to take back with us. Diana perfected the system. Martin put his arm on Mike's shoulder. Before we came, we thought your Earth was full of sub-animal creatures. Now we know otherwise. That's why we Fifth Column people want to cooperate with you. We can all live together if we exchange our knowledge and amenities. But Diana wants everything you've got. So with the help of Martin and other Fifth Columnists, the Resistance movements caused many problems to Diana and John and the visitors who were destroying the Earth. But no matter what they did, there seemed no way to beat them. Victory for the visitors appeared certain. The Earth would be destroyed. Juliet had been working in her laboratory with fellow resistance scientists for some time. They had been investigating and experimenting with bits of skin and blood samples taken from captured visitors. They had also been using laboratory reptiles. One afternoon, Mike walked into the laboratory. Juliet was quiet and pale. He went to her. What is it, Julie? A serum. A dry serum. I've been working with samples from the visitors. Yes? Well? I accidentally spilt some on the lab reptiles. They all died within seconds. So? But don't you see, Mike? It's harmless to humans. I've breathed masses of it while I've been working, and it has not affected me at all, or any of us working here. Mike was thoughtful. Can I have some, Julie? Of course, Mike, but why? I'll tell you later. The next day, Mike and Ben Taylor, who had joined the resistance with Juliet, went to a nearby water pumping station. High above hovered the visitor's mothership, and shuttle planes were busy adjusting great pipes into the reservoir, siphoning off the water. Ben swore quietly. They're draining us, Mike, drying us up. We've got to act fast. In a few months, it will be too late. Mike held his arm. We'll know if we have any hope within a few minutes, Ben. I hope this works. If it doesn't, remember me to Julie and the others and tell them that we tried. Ben looked grim. I'll keep you covered anyway, Mike, and good luck to you. Mike Donovan strolled up to the visitor guard at the pumping station gate. The visitor looked at him hard. Mike's face was on TV every night as enemy number one. The visitor recognized him, but before he could reach for his side weapon, Mike threw the dry serum dust at him. The visitor choked, gasped, held his throat and fell to the ground dead. Mike strolled back to Ben. It works. So I see. Back at the resistance headquarters, a conference was held. Juliet smiled ruefully. We've got the weapon, but how do we use it? It was Ben who came up with a possible solution. A crazy one, but just possible which relied entirely on the worldwide cooperation of other resistance groups. Within two weeks, however, that was accomplished by clandestine messengers, highly experienced in secret communication methods, and D-Day was planned. When the great day arrived, Mike was sitting just outside their camp looking across the countryside. Juliet sat beside him. All this will be gone if it doesn't work. He held her hand. It will work, Mike. It's got to. When those thousands and thousands of balloons are released at the identical moment all over the world, drifting upwards to the visitor's ships... Mike smiled. I know. And all full of serum dust. 
each balloon constructed to release it at the same time so that a cloud of serum dust permeates all around them. Now it all depends on coordination and on Martin. And Martin had arranged that Diana believed the attack was coming from the Edwards Air Force Base. He had fed information to a scientist who had been under the influence of her thought conversion process scheme. Diana was delighted with her own astute cleverness. While they were still sitting, each with their own thoughts, Martin came over from the camp. He spoke to them quietly. I'm going back to the mothership now. Why not stop here? You'll be safer, Martin. Julie asked him gently. Martin looked up at the distant mothership. I know you have vaccinated me and my fifth column colleagues against your serum, Juliet. I know it would be easier to stay here and watch. I know also that we have managed to convince John and Diana that an attack is being made on them by Air Force planes and that they will never suspect a mass of toy balloons until it is too late. Mike stood up and looked him in the eyes. Well? Martin put his hands on Mike's shoulders. My human friend, I know also there are a few of my brave colleagues up there who have not been vaccinated. I intend to deal with that matter. I must also admit to the desire to see Diana's face when she realizes she has been tricked. She is a disgrace to our species and... Julie kissed him gently on the face. And you are a different species and need to go back to Sirius and continue with your revolution. Exactly. Martin smiled. Exactly. We have enough of your amenities for a while, and I need to return your people who are stored away up there on the mother ships. The two species of beings from Earth and Sirius looked at each other with respect and affection. Eight hours later, Diana and John stood in the observation chamber of the mothership. Diana had a cruel glint in her eyes. Any moment the fools will send up their planes and try and spray us with a serum that the Resistance people believe will destroy us. John looked at her. Will they harm us? Harm us? Have you no faith in my powers of leadership? You are not the leader, Diana. I am. Diana coldly raised her side weapon and shot him. No, John. Not now. I am in sole command. Our great leader will reward me when we return. She stepped to the door. Come in, Stephen. I am in command now. Stephen looked at John's body and grinned. I said our leader had chosen you well, Diana. <laughs> yes, Stephen. The Air Force planes are due here in 20 seconds. <laughs> and we can shoot them down at leisure. My thought conversion process has proved infinitely useful. We shall have fun. <laughs> Stephen looked at the strategy board. What's this? Airborne images, thousands of them. Diana grinned. Fighters, jets. No! They're much too small. There's masses of them. They're climbing as if lighter than air. Diana switched on the view screen. They are balloons, she said incredulously. Is this some sort of joke? They're unattached. Why would they release thousands of balloons and let them rise into the atmosphere? She stiffened, her face contorted with anger. Stephen was puzzled. Do they think this will divert us from the Air Force raid? Diana turned on him savagely. Stupid! The Air Force raid was a diversion. These balloons are arranged to burst at the proper altitude for the bacteria to survive and reproduce all around us. It is obvious. We are finished. But your thought conversion process informer told us... Diana snarled. Someone misled us. We've been fooled. Stephen looked at her with scorn. I thought you had powers of leadership. Diana snapped back. We are all right so long as we are in here. The serum cloud cannot get in on us. She started to cough. <coughs> Stephen clutched his throat. A final look of hatred came over Diana's evil face as she saw Martin enter with his fifth column colleagues and calmly continue to open all the vents, allowing the cloud of reddish-tinged dust to permeate the mothership. Within hours, the human captives from San Pedro and other cities were released by Martin. The motherships were gone. The visitors were defeated.
but everyone knew the vital role that Martin and his followers had played. Juliet sat by the old resistance camp holding Mike's hand. She looked up at the infinite depth of the sky. It shows that any race or creed or even species can live together if there is goodwill 